regular at uh, Hope Reformed Baptist Church, you know that every month on Communion Sunday, we recite one of the historic Christian creeds. Uh, these are summary statements of the Christian faith firmly based on the revelation of Scripture. And why do, why do we do this? Well, for, for many reasons, but this morning I want to share something uh, that I uh, read in an article this week which I thought was really good and it gives us uh, one of the reasons we, we do this. And the writer of the art article argues that modern evangelicalism, which has boasted in a lack of creeds, is failing chiefly through that lack. He asserts, the moment you take a stand against creeds, you've firmly fixed your own. You stand by it, under it, and for it. You identify with it. That is what creeds do. They establish a framework consensus. He argues that without creeds, it becomes about the tyranny of preference, he calls it, which in evangelicalism is announced through catchphrases, evangelical jargon like doing life together, God spoke to me, God laid it on my heart, is the replacement for the creeds. That is why the ubiquitous tyranny of preferences stalks the contemporary church. Also, the lack of creeds means that different groups are always competing to establish essential DNA. But without the recurring figures of church history, their ballast is in their whims. And the problem is there is no such thing as a corporate whim. By quoting, for example, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, we embrace the bond that held together people like Athanasius and Luther and Calvin John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, Martin Lloyd-Jones and others. He says, lest you misunderstand, that bond is Jesus Christ. Without that bond, each church, no, each professing Christian, gravitates to his own ideas. This doesn't work for the simple reason that we are told we are to be the body of Christ and to be the temple of God. That's part of the reason why we recite creeds, because a people without root beliefs are not a people. Now let's look at the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was first adopted in uh, AD 325 at the Council of Nicaea. The Roman Emperor Constantine had called for the council in an attempt to unify the Christian church with one doctrine, especially on the issues of the Trinity and the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. And it reads as follows. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible, and in the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. For us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And we, looked for, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, there are just a couple of clarifications we need to make in the wording that we've just read. The first concerns the phrase Catholic and Apostolic Church. That does not mean the Roman Catholic Church as we know it today. The word Catholic simply means universal and refers to all believers who have ever placed their trust and faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, regardless of affiliation with any particular denomination. Also, we believe the word apostolic simply means built on the teaching of the apostles and it's not a statement for apostolic secession. Secondly, concerning the term baptism for the remission of sins, some Christian groups teach that water baptism is necessary for salvation. 
This is also known as baptismal regeneration. While we teach unambiguously that every Christian needs to be water baptized by immersion as an important step of obedience to Christ's command, we reject the claim that salvation is impossible without water baptism. Overall, the Nicene Creed is a great summary of core Christian doctrine. And other than the Apostles' Creed, is probably the most universally recognized statements of the Christian faith. Thank you. You're welcome, Vic. <laughs> Amen. Open up to First Timothy, would you? I'm Tom. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, I hope to afterwards. Uh, it was a pleasure just to meet somebody a, a few moments ago who had come to our uh, early service with some friends, uh, not a Christian background, no Christian family, no Christian beliefs, vaguely spiritual, and wants to find a church and become a Christian. So, uh, friends, be bringing your Christian, uh, your non-Christian friends, your unbelieving friends. If that's you, not a believer, and you've been dragged along here, they promised you free lunch afterwards or something, we're glad you're here. And our dear hope for you today is you would find forgiveness in the Lord Lord Jesus Christ, who alone gives salvation from sin and hell. Now, in oh, that, that's a good place to amen. That's pretty good. Uh, First Timothy chapter one is where we find ourselves, friends, and we're going to end out the the chapter um, of uh, that the begins this epistle. Our understanding of First Timothy has been framed by the context of the book. But Paul has established the church of Ephesus as thriving and fit and healthy and multiplying and planting other churches and preaching the gospel and a bastion of sound Reformed Baptist theology in the ancient world and ancient early church. But that in years afterwards, as Paul had left and continued his mission, other false teachers had come in. Teachers within the church had corrupted and twisted, and we'll see how today. And Paul sent back Timothy to correct things and to order things so that the church could grow again because every healthy thing needs to grow. Every healthy thing, no, it's not even a command. It's simply a statement of fact. Every healthy thing does grow and multiply down to a cellular level. And so it is also with churches that a stagnant, ungrowing church or a diminishing church is a church that is not healthy, that is not seeing new people come to faith and new families added, etc. Now, we've said before that in the Australian church, less than one in five evangelical churches grew by 10% over five years. And if you're a church of 50 in 2019, now you're a church of 55, less than one in five churches even met that benchmark in Australia. So we are in this unhealthy age, a, 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 a very spiritual but, but anti-church, anti-authoritarian, anti-tradition, anti-Christianity uh, uh, age. And so First Timothy comes to us as this tremendous uh, 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 gift from heaven to say, there is such thing as authority and it starts with Jesus. There is such a thing as order, and you have to follow orders. There is such a thing as healthy and unhealthy, good and bad, righteous and evil, and the church has to be the first people on earth. We have to be the first people in the country, if no one else will. It has to start here to acknowledge that if we don't obey Jesus, we have nothing but chaos. And so the church needs to understand, as Timothy understood, that we are under the authority of Jesus. This summarizes all of Christian ministry. This summarizes the entire book of 1 Timothy. This summarizes the entire Christian life. We are under authority. Every pastor is a man under authority. Every elder is a man under the authority of the Lord Jesus, mediated through his Bible. And every other Christian in church are people under the authority of Jesus and Bible and elders as long as they are behaving uh, duly according to Scripture. So uh, uh, the church has to be in order by following the orders of Jesus. Timothy is to charge forward because he is charged by the king of the ages. Chapter 1 verse 17, just before our passage today says, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. amen. Now, before you even, even finish saying the amen, Paul started the next line. In other words, if you amen that Jesus is dead for sinners, alive again, raised into the eternal heavens, and is reigning as Lord and King over all with his Father, who's just been exalted in that verse, if Jesus is Lord, you have to be in a church under the authority of a church, and the church has to be under the authority of that Jesus. 
In other words, you can't amen verse 17, the authority and glory of God, if then the charge that the Apostle Paul gives to churches is then ignored. If you amen Jesus' lordship, you have to then obey the commands of God through the apostles in the scriptures to the local church. Ministers are not rewarded for their creativity or their, uh, their, their personality in ministry. They are rewarded according to their faithfulness to the revealed word of God. So look at our passage today, verse 18 in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, that in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. May God bless his own authoritative word in our midst this morning. We are under authority, and Timothy has been sent to Ephesus to fix up authority. If you fix up leaders and leadership, you fix just about everything. Because things can go wrong, but they've got the right leadership to pull them back into order. The biblical image of this is, uh, is sheep and a shepherd. The sheep will wander. That's what we do. But if we have a shepherd, Jesus, and under him, under shepherds, who can draw the sheep back, discipline, guide, lead, and care for the sheep as needed, then the wandering doesn't become quite a problem. Authority is the first thing that needs to be established in Ephesus because it's become chaotic, it's become egalitarian, ladies are preaching, guys are preaching silly truths and opinions and preferences. So Timothy is sent back. What's his charge? Verse 3, he said, I've charged you to charge these men. I urge you to charge these men not to teach. He sent back to establish Jesus' authority, take back the pulpit, and fight the good warfare. He was not sent back to establish a, a family camp. The, the real issue is that the church is not unified. She needs a family camp. Oh, the real issue is that if these women are all trying to take over the pulpit and, and run from house to house and de, 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 de defy their confession, as he says in later verses, oh, they'll need a women's conference, a believe-in-yourself women's conference. No, no, what they'll need is group therapy. Stand up, Pastor Timothy, and ask anybody, just, just the, the deepest need on your heart this morning. Can you express your desires? And, and I promise to pastor according to what you want. And everybody fill out the form and tell me the things you hated most about your former churches, and I'll try and do better than that. That's not what Timothy is sent back to do. He's sent back by Paul to say, sit down, listen to God. Here's what he says. You're not allowed to preach. I'm going to correct everything they taught wrong. Jesus is king. He died for sinners. Believe in him, everybody. Amen. That's the summary, really, of chapter one so far. He wasn't sent back to get creative, do some therapy. He was sent back to enforce God's commands. In verse three, he's urged to charge certain persons. In five, Paul summarizes the ministry and says, the aim of our charge is love. Yes, it's loving, but it is a charge. In verse 12, he says that Jesus appointed me to his service, and, was, and, and that's the language of being allocated into a slavery position. In verse 18, he, call, he says that I charge you, Timothy. That is, I allot something to you. I officially delegate something to you. I appoint you over this thing that I've just told you. And that this, in verse 18, refers backwards to everything he said in chapter 1 and forwards to everything he's going to say about prayer, worship, gender, church discipline, money, pastors, and all of the rest in the rest of the book. This charge, this appointment, this delegation to you, Timothy, I've given, if we can summarize 1 Timothy chapter 1, it's been confront the false teachers, correct the false teaching, and apply the gospel as universally applicable and urge it on people to believe. Don't suggest it. Don't say, this is what the church believes. I don't know what you believe, but hopefully maybe one day you consider maybe possibly what we believe about Jesus. Wrong. Paul said, here's an applicable, trustworthy saying. Jesus is dead for sinners and alive again. Believe in him, everybody. So that's, that's the charge of pastors. Confront false teachers, correct the teaching, accept, uh, 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 urge the acceptable gospel message on everybody, and then everything else he's going to say in the rest of the book will follow with this authoritative command. Now, th there was some things which are very contextual for Timothy, but the principles that we're seeing are universal. And one of the realities is this, that a pastor who does these things alone 
is the kind of pastor who can say before God, I love my congregation. The people who obey this alone are the elders and pastors who can say before God, I love these people that have been allocated to me to care for. Pastor gets up and he tries to be creative, tries to go, I know this is what Paul said, but oh, that was very contextual and cultural and let's change that. Let's, uh, he's very old. Fashion, here's what I want to do for the people. And Timothy rocks up to Ephesus and he, and he has, a, has a focus group with the women who are preaching about why, what their felt needs and maybe their past uh, hurts are as to why they're expressing psychologically their sin in this way. Sorry, I didn't mean to call it sin. Um, their hurts in these ways, their victimhood in these ways. He doesn't do that. He's sent back to authoritatively command. And only the pastors who do that, only Timothy, when he does that, can say, I'm loving them. The aim of our charge is love, but it's not loving to edit Paul's commands and to do something different for and over the church. So pastors do these things or they don't love the church. Paul doesn't even say, go back and in the first opening sentence of this pastoral epistle, like you would expect if you go to seminary these days in our world, you know, the first thing that a pastor needs to tell them is that he cares for them and he loves them. And they are, they are really trying their best. And he doesn't have any, any sort of heavy-handed authority to hand out. He just wants you to know that he loves you. None of that. The actions is love. This is biblical love. Actions that lead to conformity to Christ, that's a pastor's heart and love. So don't go to somewhere that you're pandered and you're patted on the back and you're therapied in group settings. Go somewhere where you are told what the Bible says and how to obey it. That is a loving pastor right there. Confront false teachers, correct the error, preach the gospel. Jesus is king. Timothy is a man under authority and so is every other minister. And this authority that is over him commands him in the context of Warfare. Look at verse 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy. Authority. In accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, uh, this is, we see this in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. We see this later in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We see this back in Acts chapter 16. That when Timothy was younger and Paul was passing through Lystra, uh, the elders of the church said, Tim, you've got to keep your eye on Timothy. He's amazing. He can, he's a good guy. He's a godly man. We, we think that God is calling him to ministry. And uh, he was, uh, then had hands laid upon him before he went with Paul. And they ordained him to the ministry. And they prayed over him. And what we see from putting these verses together is that in that moment, God spoke prophetically to the elders and said something about his future or about him. But we understand that it is something about the gift of preaching because Paul later says, you received this gift of teaching in the laying on of hands. So God kind of imparted to him this, this apostolically blessed, this spiritual uh, uh, powerful gift unto him that he was being called to be a preacher and an orator and a, and a declarer of divine truth as a pastor. And that had to be given by prophecy because naturally he was very timid. He was drawn back. He's, he, he's a young man. He, he didn't grow up with his dad, it seems. So he's, he's a little bit more on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the feminine side, being brought up by mom and grandma. He was in touch with his feelings. He needed to get in touch with his guts. And preaching just wasn't really on his cards. And God spoke to him in that moment. And by prophecy, called him to be a preacher and gave him a gift. Gave, gave, gave him a gift. Uh, and so Paul is recalling that and saying, remember when Jesus called you? Remember when Jesus himself said prophetically through the other elders that you were called of God to serve the church? That I'm asking you to remember so that you can charge forward in the warfare. And he says here that by them, that is according to this charge and in remembrance of the prophecy, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Ministry in, in Paul's writings is pictured as warfare. In fact, the Christian life is pictured as warfare. And we've said before that some people don't like that and you're uncomfortable with a militant mindset in a church and it feels just uh, too harsh or too masculine or too militant or, or you know, it's, not, it's not quite as nice as I'd like. And God's word for you this morning, he's just put it on my heart, is repent. The Bible uses this language Paul uses this language. The, uh, the, 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 the idea that God wants us to have of ministry is warfare. The Christian life is 
warfare. He doesn't just say it once or twice. He says it continually throughout all of his letters, Paul says. In 1 Timothy 1.18 right here, wage the good warfare, pastor. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of the faith, pastor Timothy. In Ephesians 6 verse 12, he speaks to the same church, Ephesus, but on the whole and says, this is spiritual warfare. We've got enemies. We need to wrestle with the devil and the spiritual realm. We have uh, armor and we have weapons. In 2 Corinthians 10.4, Paul says that he has weapons of our warfare. In 2 Timothy 4.7, towards the end of his life, writing from prison, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. Not cuddled the good cuddle. I have fought the good fight. That's his gravestone. That should be on every Christian's gravestone, at least in principle. Fighting the fight of God. Revelation 17 verse 14. As John foresees this cosmic battle between God's enemies and the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. He says, they will make war on the Lamb and the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The Old Testament prophesies uh, the Messiah and calls him a man of war, a military general. Revelation shows to us that Jesus is a fighter, is a conqueror. The question becomes, are you? Jesus is a fighter, are you? Or are you too Christ-like to be like Christ? Jesus is an overcomer, are you? The, Revel the book of Revelation calls constantly for the people of God to be overcomers of the world, the flesh, and the devil. In fact, it says that only those who do overcome are actually those who belong to Jesus Christ. He is a conqueror, are you? And this is not just a responsive uh, kind of warfare. Right? We read, read, read that word, fight the good fight of the faith. And it sounds, maybe you, you could read it, it sounds a little bit more passive, a little bit more defensive. That is, you're the peaceful German, uh, sorry, no, I, I don't know whether those two words go together. The peaceful French farmer, peasant, out in the Alps, and you have a beautiful farm. And if, per se, a Nazi soldier or battalion come across your land, then you should fight well and defend and, 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 and stand up for king, country, uh, king, and, you know, uh, your land. Sure, yeah, fight the good fight in that context. That's not what Paul is saying. When Paul uses the word wage the good warfare, it is more in the understanding of devise the good war campaign. It's more broad than simply when attacked, fight back faithfully. It's actually orient your life, fix your posture, find a way to be faithful to Jesus so that you can wage the war campaign against the kingdom of darkness. As a pastor, this means Devise plans and think forward with some foresight and vision. This means plan, calculate some operations to put into place. Train people for certain roles. Keep an eye on the enemy and the landscape. And take ground through rapid and radical expansionism for the Lord Jesus Christ. Expansionism is the cause of wars on earth. Expansionism is the cause of peace in the spiritual realm. Continually expand. You see an idol, pray that it topples, and at nighttime, like Gideon, maybe do it yourself. When there is peace, however, right, so this means there is no actual, there's no such thing as a spiritual pacifist. I'm a Christian, but I got saved in the 70s, and my pastor wore fisherman's pants and thongs, and I'm more one of those <laughs> pacifist, uh, uh, peace loving Christians. Or, or maybe today I went to a, a rainbow church before I came here, or I was, I, I'm more on, the, I'm more on the, 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 the softer, the kinder, the lover, the more ge gentle side of Christianity. So I'm glad that some people are fighting the fight, but that's not for me. No such thing. Every Christian is called to the war, young and old. There's no spiritual pacifism. The Bible calls that. Cowardice says that cowards are the unfaithful thrown into the lake of sulfur. In the spiritual realm, there's also no neutrality. You are either, Jesus says this, you are either for Jesus, believing in him, confessing his gospel, fighting with him, obeying him as king, or you are against him, fighting his activities, rebelling against his law, and teaming up with Satan who controls you. So some of you will want to say that you are neutral. You're undecided on Jesus, but you're definitely not against him. And that you're spiritual and you're open to uh, all truths and you're, you're interested in what the Bible might say, but you're, you're more neutral to Jesus. And God's word to you this morning would be one of invitation and warning. 
you actually are not neutral to Jesus. If you're not for Jesus, believing in Jesus, saved by Jesus, you're an enemy of Jesus. And if you disagree, Jesus doesn't disagree. He'll treat you like an enemy at his return and you will be judged. There is one of warning. There is also invitation. Come to Jesus right now. Well, he stands as judge at the end of history. He stands as savior right now, inviting mercifully for people to come unto him. And that's you. But you are either an enemy in this warfare or you are one of his people who are chosen and faithful to God. If there is no real peace, sometimes, this is where there needs to be God, godly troublemaking, like, like, like Elijah was called, the troubler of Israel. That's a good name sometimes for pastors in times when, when there is a pretended or supposed peace. I mean, the pastors, the, the church needs at least a little part of its ministry to be the troublemaking ministry, the, the declaring war ministry. Because what the devil often does is through politics or through uh, 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 bureaucracy or through, uh, 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 you know, ecumenism uh, and through coexist bumper stickers, he sort of declares a peace that God didn't call for. So he comes knocking on your door while you're throwing the, sh the, uh, the, 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 the armament into the, 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 the cannons ready to shoot. He comes knocking on your door and says, oh no, no, we've published peace, cease fire, cease fire, put it down, put it down brother, we're all good. There's no enemy anymore and of course he is the greatest enemy. He's simply disarming you so that you can be overrun and overcome and overtaken. So where the devil or where people or where culture or where society or where even our sinful selves and sinful ministers declare a peace, sometimes the church needs to activate that, that war declaration ministry and actually call out the warfare, which is actually already there. It's just been plastered over with a pretended peace. Hugh Latimer is a tremendous example of precisely this. Hugh Latimer was a reformer, 1500s in England, and over him was King Henry VIII. And if you know your Reformation history, you know that one of the great uh, 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 fights, one of the great grounds of battle in the English Reformation was to what degree does the monarch have control and authority over the church? Now we know that they are a monarch. They have genuine authority in the world over society. How much does that spread over to the church? Now I say that's a, an area of, disagree, of battle and pushing back and forth. Not because people didn't know where they stood. They weren't trying to understand the problem. There's just the Puritans and uh, those separatists who understood that Christ alone is head of the church. And then there was the monarchs, and there was the royal elites, and there was the lords, and there was the Catholics or some of the high Anglicans who saw absolutely that the rule of the king and queen ought to be carried out by their royal subjects, their people, the church. The Puritans died. The Covenanters died. They sealed their confession in their blood for saying there's only one head of the church, and we're not going to obey the guy sitting over there in a golden chair. Hugh Latimer was somebody who preached for war when there was a pretended peace. Right? So King Henry VIII of England is Hugh Latimer, who was a con convert of Thomas Bliney, who got burned at the stake. Hugh Latimer would later get burned at the stake by King Edward's daughter, uh, King Henry's daughter, sorry. And as he was preaching, this firebrand preacher, this, 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 this golden-tongued, dipped-in-heaven preacher in England, he was invited to preach for the king. Mistake number one, King Henry. He was invited to preach for the king, and as he went and he preached, he preached God's word. Would you, would you believe it? And he preached God's word against kings, and against tyranny, and against sin, and against unrighteousness, and against opposing Jesus Christ's purpose. And could you imagine King Henry was offended? His poor little royal offense became the problem of the country. And so what he said was, Hugh Latimer, get out of here, go away, prepare a new sermon, and come and preach next week. <laughs> If you get one swing at a king, the best thing is, is another one. And so he comes back and, and Hugh Latimer is given the pulpit again. He's given the stage and here's King Henry sitting over there watching, close eye, be careful, you know who I am. And Latimer opens his sermon like this. Latimer. Latimer, do you remember that today you're speaking before the high and mighty King Henry VIII who has power to command you to be sent to prison? And who can have your head cut off if it pleases him? Will you not take care today to say nothing that will offend him? Then he paused. And he continued. Oh, Latimer. Latimer, do you not remember that you are speaking before the king of kings? And today before the Lord of lords, he said to himself, Before him at whose throne King Henry will give account. 
before him to whom one day you will give an account. Latimer, Latimer, be faithful to your master and declare all of God's words. And then he preached the exact same sermon as last week. (laughs) That's my kind of guy. Because ministry is warfare, when there's pretended peace, ungodly tyrants are perfectly peaceful, heads of the church, and they seek to destroy God's work, people like Latimer, and trust me, he was hated in his day. The other pastors blogged about, oh, he needed to be more winsome. He really lost an opportunity of, uh, of uh, ecumenism here and bureaucracy. He really could have done a good, good work for the Reformation if he wasn't so hot-headed. But today we call him a prophet and we thank God for him. We need more men like that today. Spiritual warfare is fought on many levels. Now, we need to say this. Peter misunderstood this concept early, in early days. When Jesus was being arrested, Peter had in his mind, fight the good fight, establish the kingdom of God. He grabbed a sword. He went to kill the high priest. The high priest's servant got in the way, probably, and it wasn't even a very good shot because he just chopped the guy's ear off. Jesus heals the ear and says to Peter, sheath your sword. Put it away. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. Later on, he said, if I had a kingdom of this world, then my people would be fighting for it, but they're not. Jesus has a kingdom that is not of or not from or not originating in this world. It is above this world, coming down into this world. It is more powerful than this world, but it is not physical. It is not primarily political, even emotional. It is a warfare fought on various fronts. Let's say this, in any warfare... In any battle, war, great war, there's always multiple levels of the battle. There's, I guess, the the actual uh, infantry level. Bullets going back and forth over the trenches. There is the political level of warfare. What men do we have in power and what strings can we pull here? There's the economical element of the warfare. We need to have more industry to be able to send more funds to the front line. There is the propaganda level of the warfare. We need to convince everybody we're the good guys so that history sees us as such. There is all sorts of levels of warfare, and we could say the same of spiritual warfare. We need to sort of distinguish and understand on what level is God calling us to wage warfare? There is the first and absolute and most highest degree of, the, of, the, of history and of warfare that we can first say. In the highest level, there is no spiritual warfare. As far as God himself stands over history, as far as God in himself rules over all of time and in his, is himself outside of time, we do not believe in some kind of cosmic eternal yin and yang. That there is an eternal good God and there is an eternal devil. No, before God made the devil, there was no devil. Before God created history, there was no history in turmoil and back and forth. So on the highest level, on the highest realm of sovereignty and power and existence in all the world, there is no spiritual warfare. There is a God whose decrees and plans are perfect and they are being carried out exactly as he has decreed. On the next level down, we could say in the grand cosmic scheme of things, in history, the battle is between God and Satan. On a broader level, we could then say on the next level that the battle, the spiritual warfare is waged between the domain of Satan and the domain of Jesus. That is the world under the influence of Satan and uh, those under the influence of Christ's new covenant established in blood, filled with the spirit, we could say that is, a, is, is the next degree of warfare. But we don't really fight on that cosmic level. Okay, well, the next level might be political, that there are evil tyrants against godly people. That's one level of the warfare. Revelation, the book, has plenty to say about that. Maybe the next level down is the religious level. It is the church against all other religions and ideologies. But we still don't really fight on that level. Then we could say another level is is righteousness and unrighteousness. But the deepest level, the truest level, I would say the most ground level, which is the level upon which we are called to wage war, is is the spiritual warfare between truth and error. Truth and error at odds is the grounds upon which that is the plan, that is the map, that is the land that the church is called to battle on. We're not called to take spiritual authority from Satan. We're not called to do things that only Jesus can do. We're not called to change God's decrees. What we can do is battle on this front, truth versus error. This is the battle of Christian pastoral ministry. On this front, the entire battle is lost. The entire war campaign of Christian spiritual warfare 
is won or lost on whether people understand and embrace the truth as it is in Jesus or hate and reject the truth. In fact, we could say, if the West or if Christendom took this enormous political sway, every nation became uh, uh, followers of the moral law. Every nation became highly righteous, highly civilized, highly unified. And there was just this utopia that Queen Victoria could not even imagine. The greatest of dreams has finally come true. Sort of a one world unified government. No communism, how good would that be? Just, just godly, Christian influenced politics all over the world, getting on no wars. If that were the case, and people were not converted unto Christ by an understanding of the gospel in Jesus, still the spiritual realm would have taken no vantage forwards in the warfare. And we know this because Satan actually offered that to Jesus. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, Satan said to him, look at all the kingdoms of all the world in all of history. You can have them. You can rule them. You can reign them. You can, you, you can enforce all of your righteousness on all of them, so long as, first, you worship me, and then, secondly, the confession of all of them becomes, Satan is Lord. And Jesus mocked that, hated that, despised that idea, threw it to the side and went to the cross. Because political advantage, economical advantage, all of those other things, they just aren't actual spiritual warfare unless the truth of the gospel is being understood. On this front, all of our battle is fought as a church. In fact, I would say this, the communication of truth is not only the most practical or the most important weapon of our warfare, I will say that the communication of truth is our only weapon in spiritual warfare. You don't have a single other weapon in spiritual warfare to utilize other than speaking the truth and communicating it from God. You might say, well, doesn't Ephesians 6 give us a whole bunch of armor and a whole bunch of weapons? No, he gives us a bunch of armor, one weapon, which is the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Your one weapon in the spiritual warfare is communicating God's truth. You might say, well, I, 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 I protest still. What about prayer? Isn't prayer one of our great weapons? No, it is not. Prayer is not your weapon in the spiritual warfare. Because you can't do anything with prayer. Only God can do things with prayer. Prayer is not a weapon that we wield and immediately and directly change our situations, people's hearts, or even the spiritual realm. Prayer is a confession to God saying, Lord, General, King, you've not given us a weapon to fight this. I can't control the situation. I can't snap my fingers or pour some oil and make somebody converted. Here's an area beyond my weaponry. Here's an area beyond our ability. Please send the cavalry. Please send the airstrike. Please, Lord, you do what only you can do. That's what prayer is, not our weapon. A call on God to utilize his power through his weaponry. You might say, well, what about, what about the demonic realm, right? What about spiritual attacks and demonization and, and deliverance ministry, right? Go, doesn't this matter about, about a, a spiritual warfare? That is not spiritual warfare. Let me say just really clearly, and some of you have heard me say this over coffee, and maybe I sound like a bit of a brutal pastor. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you're genuinely saved, and you come to me and you let me know that there's been some kind of spiritual attack and there was the old hag or, or, or a sleep uh, uh, insomnia or sleep paralysis or these dreams or these horrible visions or hallucinations or voices, my honest and deepest word for you is I don't care. So long as you know the truth of the gospel of Jesus and with me you can say I don't care. Do you realize that that's all the demons can do? First of all, not that bad. Your head's still on your shoulders. You're not skinned alive. As far as the spectrum of Christian persecution through life goes, some bad sleep is pretty okay. We'll be fine. But as all, all that the demons can do, if they do attack you, and they may, the only thing they could do, even to their worst degree, the only thing they can actually do to you is confuse you or blind you to the truth. 
They give you the worst sleep in the world, all of these attacks, hallucinations, and whatever else, which are dealt with fairly simply by repentance and faith, and out they go. But if they, even if that was haranguing you, and God just decided in your life to just allow it to happen, still, if you know Jesus is Lord, I am forgiven, I am cleansed, I have the Spirit, they can't control me, I am freed, then they can do nothing but silly scare tactics. So no, actually, the demonic realm, their, their attack is also on the realm of truth. As long as they can twist truth, confuse people, and keep them from understanding the truth, that's the only sense that they are effective in spiritual warfare. But back onto our level, back onto the practical level, warfare is a truth, spiritual warfare is a truth-based warfare. The most fundamental, tangible, practical level, spiritual warfare is between truth and error, and therefore, Christian ministry is a warfare ministry of preaching truth and tearing down ideological strongholds. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. I'd love you to write that down to reference later. Paul says that we have these weapons of warfare that are divinely empowered, but they're not fleshly. I don't have some enormous sword sitting at home. I don't have some, 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 some pistol that's been given to me by Michael the Archangel by which we can slay demons and vampires. What we have, Paul says, is the preaching of God's word, which like grappling hooks, take a hold of towers of misunderstandings and confusions and heresies and ideologies and other religions and rejections of Jesus... The preaching of God sends hooks upon those bricks, pulls them down so that the truth can flood into that heart. That's warfare. That's spiritual warfare. That's how you beat demons if you care about that. So Timothy is commanded then, remember your calling, remember the prophecy made over you, wage the warfare of truth, confront the false teachers, correct the false teaching, preach the gospel, and from chapter 2 till 6, he gives more commands for the church. The church fights this battle on the grounds of truth. Look at these essential elements of the truth, of, sorry, of spiritual warfare in verse 19. He says, fight the good fight, wage that good warfare by holding faith and a good conscience. That's what that comma there is suggesting. Holding faith and a good conscience. This is how you do that waging of warfare, faith and conscience. He says this back in verse 5 as well. The aim of our charge is love. And he includes in the motivations from a good, uh, sincere faith and uh, a good conscience. He says later on in the book, he emphasizes conscience and faith. This is a, a continual use of these words in the pastoral epistles by Paul. But really, we could say faith and conscience. If you have genuine faith in Jesus Christ and you have a clean conscience before God, that encapsulates your entire Christian life. Everything in your Christian life and Christian ministry is summed up in that. Faith saves you. Jesus has died for you. You've trusted that. You are going to heaven. You have the Holy Spirit. You're regenerated. All of that. Then good conscience means literally everything. You go, well, well, well what if they're sinning? Well, that, then they won't have a good conscience. Okay, but what if they don't know the words of God? Oh, yes, learning is essential, and that needs to come under a good conscience. Well, what about their obedience levels? Yes, they will need a good conscience before God, which demands learning, obedience, repentance, confession, the means of grace, faithfulness, all of that comes under a good conscience. In other words, Paul is saying in this holistic sense, in this very brief sense, your whole Christian self must remain pure in your belief, and in your good conscience of action and mind for you to be able to wage this warfare faithfully. A good conscience is so important in the battle of truth. Your conscience is kind of like the arteries that go around your heart, your cardiac pump, your actual physical heart. The, the arteries that go throughout your body are very important, but the most important arteries are the arteries that go from your heart to the heart itself. If those become calcified, if those become filled with plaque, if those become damaged and hemorrhaging, then the heart itself, not peripheries, not eyes, not, not even mental capacity, not your toes, not your liver, the heart itself, the very, the, the very heart, right? The very heart of your health and your body begins to decay because the thing feeding the heart is starting to decay. And that's what a conscience is like. You can be in a church with amazing teaching. You can be reading amazing books. You can have the best 
blood there is in your body, you can be swimming in it. If your conscience has unrepented sin, if sensitivity to the Spirit has been calloused because you don't like what He's telling you to do, if knowing where you're sinning has been ignored by you and you're pushing down these areas, then you're blocking the arteries to your very soul. And everything else can be perfectly healthy on the outside, but your heart is corroded. It's like, it's like having cataracts. You can be in front of beautiful and true things, but it can't get in. If the conscience is dim, if the conscience is worn down, if the conscience is seared, the blood can't get to your soul. The truth is filtered out because your conscience is seared. Your conscience is dirty. Calvin said this, and this introduces us to this whole dynamic that Paul's talking about in a very surprising way in verse 19. It's reversed to what we usually think. We think, oh, my friend, he lost faith, then he started sleeping with his girlfriend. Wrong. He started seeing hot girls, started looking at things online, started sleeping around, then he started questioning whether the Bible was trustworthy. That's how it happens. Oh, my husband met somebody at work and, and started, uh, 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 sorry, he, he lost his faith in the Bible and then we started growing distant and it turned out he got a girlfriend to cope with it all. Wrong. He started cheating on you. He started avoiding going to church because of his bad conscience. Godly men love church. Amen, someone? Amen. You're not coming because you don't want to be found out for something. Later on, the excuses come out. Paul says, Calvin agrees, the conscience, the ethics, the moral side happens first, then the faith is destroyed. Calvin said this, a bad conscience is the mother of all heresies. A bad conscience is the mother of all heresies. Not confusion, not a lack of clarity that God revealed, not actually interest or being too smart for the other Christians, a bad conscience. Unrepentant sin sitting in the caverns of their heart causes error. We don't usually think this way. We think truth is merely intellectual. Faith and behavior is moral. Did you know that, that Proverbs tells us that a pursuit of knowledge after the Holy One begins with a fear of God? Knowledge is ethical. Truth comes to those who are holy and pure. Error comes into the heart of those who are sinful. That doesn't mean we don't get confused. We don't need to ask questions and we learn. That's every one of us. But, but you need to realize that error is really just a type of sin. So the reason that you keep on falling into horrible errors or the reason that people keep on swinging out of the church into cults and errors is because they developed a palate for error by feeding their heart with sin. Sin first, then error. That's how it goes. Paul says, by rejecting this, in the Greek that this refers to the good conscience, by rejecting this good conscience... Some have made shipwreck of their faith. And then he goes on to give us specific examples. Uh, we see in 1 Timothy chapter 4 this same principle. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Wow, the demons got into their mouths. The demons got into their teaching and they're devoted to that. How did this happen? Well, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. They just had little sins. They just refused to repent of them. They just hid them. They just kept denying that there was... A, they kept on taking communion when they should have part, not partaken. They kept on lying. Everything's fine. I would love that ministry opportunity. Oh, I would love to be seen as somebody with this reputation. I would love that. I would love that. And their conscience all the while is calcifying. Their heart is breaking. And then error comes into their heart and the demons use them to turn people in the church astray. Many people cannot lead strongly... In church ministry, many pastors, why do we have such, such a plague of effeminate, soft pastors? Let's just say in Australia. Because we have sinning pastors or unregenerate pastors. Pastors who can't lead strongly because too much attention comes onto them. Somebody might find out about their girlfriend on the side. Or their internet pornography addiction. Or their malpractice in the faith. You can't lead strongly if you think you're under the displeasure of God. You can't preach clearly and strongly if you're doing the same sins you're telling people to stop doing. 
You cannot run forward with the confidence that comes from knowing that you have a clear conscience before Jesus, knowing that he calls you as a commander to lead the warfare forwards. You can't do that if you're not even sure if God's happy with you or not. A bad conscience is the mother of all heresies. Calvin says this, Why is it that so many lay aside the gospel and run off into weird sects and wicked cults and become involved in monstrous errors? It is because by this kind of blindness, God punishes hypocrisy. By their blindness to to truth, God punishes hypocrisy. In other words, when a pastor is falling out of the ministry, there's been some kind of moral scandal, he's been sleeping with somebody, doing some kind of drug, stealing money from church, whatever it may be, and he falls out of the ministry, our initial and good response is, that's tragic. Our secondary response needs to be, I'm also glad it happened. Because the worst thing would have been him to keep that sin hidden and secret, started to spread the erroneous demonic lies into the congregation and been the source of corruption to God's people. See, that God actually prefers the lesser of those two evils. He says, I will make his downfall public because he wouldn't confess his sin. Paul lists them by name. He says, as are Hymenaeus and Alexander. This is their example. Look at everybody. Here's our, here's our tour guide, Paul the Apostle. He's saying, if you don't stay straight and narrow, if you don't listen to King Jesus, if your conscience is not clear, and you don't have clear communication with our commander of this naval fleet, look what will happen to you. There is the great shipwreck, Hymenaeus. Everybody, turn your attention this way. There's Alexander. They used to be great preachers. Now they're buskers. Now they're in sinful relationships. Oh, now they're a banker or a politician. Now they're shipwrecks according to the faith. Why? They did not pay attention to their conscience. Richard Baxter, who lectured to many uh, pastors and called them to be converted and have faith, because many back then were not. He called them to repent and work hard for the Lord Jesus and put aside their sins. He says this, that God would prefer a public scandal. No, that's, that's me. Uh, let me quote Baxter. He says this. He, God will force our consciences to confession or his judgments shall proclaim our iniquities in the world. As God puts pressure upon the minister, who is the leader of God's people, he says, you will either confess your conscience and repent of your sin Or I will make your downfall known to everybody and you'll be a scandal. You'll blaspheme my name, for sure. It will look bad on me, but I would prefer that than your hypocrisy hidden under the veil of peace in my church. God would prefer a public scandalous fall of a man out of the ministry than for him to continue to minister without a sincere faith and a good conscience. That principle applies to every Christian too. The most important, more precious than jewel belonging that you have is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have that, no matter what occurs, no matter how poor or impoverished or persecuted your life is, you have riches forever in heaven. Nothing is more valuable than faith. The next best thing, right up there with faith, is a good conscience. Because by a good conscience, you can enjoy faith. By a good conscience, you can await heaven without fear. By a good conscience, you can pray to your Father, who you know is not against you. With a good conscience, you can bring your sins and failures to Jesus and list them all and be very open and go to those you've sinned against and name them and apologize and request forgiveness because the faith that has saved you is changing you. And this good conscience allows that to happen. The first thing to stop your faith from benefiting you is a bad conscience. But it may be that if you tolerate a bad conscience, you actually don't have saving faith. This is the shipwreck that Paul warns us about. He therefore says at the end of verse 20, these men, Hamanaeus and Alexander, I have delivered over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. People ask me sometimes, does your church have a deliverance ministry? I say, yep. It's called church discipline. We deliver the sinning and the unrepentant and the heretical over to Satan. There's your deliverance ministry. This is what Paul says. He uses the same language in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. This is language of church discipline. Now, that's 
probably unknown, but fairly scary to a lot of people. The language of church discipline and excommunication is not some big, heavy guillotine that we put up on church during members' meetings and do this French Revolution-style fear-mongering. Church discipline is simply that the elders are tasked with teaching and admonishing the people. And like shepherds, if sheep are wandering, we correct and bring them back. If they refuse to be corrected, we have to bring them back with some force and some warnings. If they refuse to come back, then we come and we say, we're no longer considering this person a part of Christ's sheep because they're not listening to his voice. And Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice. So church discipline is just a matter of being able to say who's a genuine Christian and who's calling themselves a Christian while holding to heresy or unrepentant sin. That's all it is. It protects the church. But Paul, as an apostle, had this heightened level of authority because he spoke for Jesus and he didn't have to vote on church discipline. He didn't have to ask a church if they agree with him on church discipline. He could click his fingers and excommunicate you. And he does that. Here, Hymenaeus and Alexander... He is, uh, were guys from Ephesus, and Paul is telling Timothy, let everybody know that their two favorite pastors are now out of ministry because they're behaving like they're outside of the kingdom, and Jesus told me to cut them out. So just tell the people that. In 1 Corinthians 5, and this is more of our context, Paul tells the church to do the voting and the work. So Paul says, look, on my end, I have already delivered over a judgment about the guy that is sleeping with his stepmother. But now, because you guys committed the sin of tolerance, because you guys were were, were loving and you had on your church website diversity and equity and inclusion, and you liked and you actually celebrated with some pride, that you had so much grace that the incestuous guy comes to our church. He said, because you shared in his sin, I'm going to let the discipline fall on you as well. You have to vote and kick him out yourselves. That's the normal process of church discipline, is that the elders of the local churches or members vote on to remove pastors, members, or uh, uh, or deacons from ministry or from ordination or from membership. That's that's church discipline, and it comes up later in the book with some more details. But notice the, the, the process. You are either a minister who thinks lightly of your commission, who thinks small thoughts about being called to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, So you don't give a rip that your conscience is a bit dirty. You don't look after your uniform if you don't care about the army. You don't look after your flag if you don't care for your country. And you don't look after your conscience if you don't care about Jesus' command over your life as a pastor. And then what happens? Then sin grows. The church should, should lose their confidence in you and vote to remove you and take away their trust of you. That's the the, the degradation of the shipwrecking of faith for those who are not Christ's sheep. In Timothy's case, it is precisely the opposite. What we hope and pray for is precisely the opposite. A man of God takes his commission to wage the good warfare seriously. I'm commanded of the highest authority on earth to the greatest job on earth, preaching Jesus' gospel and leading the church. Therefore, I will look after my most important asset, which is my conscience. I will hold my faith and I will protect this conscience because if it gets dirty, everything goes astray. And when he does that, as he ministers faithfully, the church gives their trust. The church relate to him as an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ. He, he, his conscience is, is, is even benefited further, and he is rewarded from Jesus, and therefore not handed over to Satan to learn not to blaspheme. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of all lords and the King of all kings. We as a church need to be committed to the same things that Timothy is commanded to tell the Ephesians. He's going to be told, command the things that I'm telling you to the Ephesian church. And after them, every other church. And that's us. We have to be a church that is open, willing, and glad when false teaching is opposed. We have to be eyes wide open and recognizing we are in a warfare. And and this matters. and, And our consciences need to be clean. Or we will be of no use. Or worse, we will be of bad use. And we will become shipwrecks. We have to be those who believe in God's authoritative system, the, the hierarchy in the church, the, 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 the God's authority of the word of God over every area of our life and ministry. And in as much as we do that, we trust Pauline results where there was Pauline ministry. We trust Timothy type results where there is Timothy kind of ministry. And that means people coming to know Jesus, your gifts being utilized in the mission of the church and God getting glory in the church 
for all ages, world without end. Amen and amen. amen. If you're not a Christian, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, if you have not entrusted yourself to him to save your sins, if you haven't experienced from that a transformation, a, a new life, new desires, a, a new way of thinking, if that hasn't happened to you, then today the Lord Jesus Christ, the highest authority of the world, holds out his wounded hands to you through the word of God and welcomes you to come and eat of all the spiritual benefits he puts out. He offers and invites and welcomes you to come and be received into the family of God because he has paid your way. He comes and beckons you, be forgiven of your sin because it has been paid for in his blood. But you must have faith. You must come to that invitation. You must look towards Jesus in your mind, in your soul, and trust yourself to him and even call out in your heart right now. And as we pray and as we sing, Lord Jesus, please have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's pray. Father God, for anybody in our midst who is in that place, they, they are recognizing themselves as a sinner, but they know they are outside of Jesus. Would by the Spirit, you this morning give, give a heart of faith to call out to Jesus. Say, Jesus save me. To entrust themselves to him and to be confident in his saving power and ability. Please transform lives and, and bring a transfer from the, the domain and the kingdom of darkness under Satan into the kingdom of light of your Son and the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God, that we would be a church now and ongoing, defended by your holy armies against spiritual attack that would, that would disunify, that would uh, uh, cause to fray our union, that would distract and that would bring in sin and corruption. Lord God, we pray for this because only you can ultimately bring it. We do ask that you make us faithful in those things you've given to us. A love of the truth and a keeping our consciences clean before you. We pray all of this in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said...